Um, welcome back to Drupal Core Therapy. Sorry, I'm in the core conversation track. Um, I'm XJM, and I'm on, that's on Drupal.org. My name is Jess. I'm probably best known in the Drupal community for the core contribution mentoring program, but I'm also one of four co-leads for the Views in Drupal Core initiative. And uh, more recently, I work in the office of the CTO at Acquia, um, and my job title is Code and Community Strategist. So what that means is that Dries is my boss, and I work on core stuff basically full time, which is pretty cool. Um, so the, the title of this core conversation is Making Big Changes, um, and that's big changes in Drupal Core, not in your personal life, sorry. I'm going to briefly describe four uh, different case studies of big patches in Drupal Core, and then summarize some of the lessons I think we learned from them. Um, and then after that, we can sort of discuss what to do about it. Um, but first, I'd like to scope this a little bit. Uh, I'm going to leave aside for now anything about how to run an initiative in general. Um, I think Shannon already covered that. And I also want to talk more specifically about individual issues, individual patches in core, and also issues that are outside the scope of any one initiative. I also don't want to talk about uh, tools we don't have yet, like GitHub, like Im improvements to the Drupal.org issue queues. Um, because I think that there's been at least one session and one core conversation devoted to those topics already. And finally, I don't want to talk about whether our workflow works best with patches versus sandboxes versus core branches versus uh, unicorns because I don't really think that we'd like resolve that or even, I think if we started that debate, we'd actually be in here until code freeze. So I'm going to skip past that for now, at least in my portion of this this conversation. It's very, it's not, calling it a conversation is a little bit strange because like I talk at you for half of it and then there's the conversing part. So I, I, there's, it needs a different label. Um, so we have the saying in Drupal core that the drop is always moving. And this means that we're willing to innovate and make bold changes that make Drupal better. Um, at the same time, though, big changes expose us to risks and they can be difficult to manage. Um, they add to our technical debt. And even if our goal is to reduce the technical debt in the long term, in the short term, they're definitely inducing more and that's a risk. Um, they lead to issues with hundreds of comments. This, this frustrates all of us, um, and it leads to people burning out and tuning out. Uh, big patches, are they, they break a lot. They're, they're difficult to re-roll, um, and if, if the need comes, they're also very difficult to roll back. Um, and a particular problem that's close to my heart, they're freaking hard to review. And for the re all the reasons above, they cause contributor burnout. Whether, whether you're reviewing the patch, whether you're testing the patch, whether you're just someone following the patch who's interested in it, and especially for the patch author, um, it, it, it's, it can be really discouraging. Even if you're successful in the end, it can be a very trying experience. Uh, so let's talk specifics. I can't do that. <laughs> I'm going to describe four uh, examples of big changes in core during the Drupal 8 release cycle and just walk through roughly what happened in those issues. Um, and the first change in the issue is probably my favorite moment in the entire Drupal 8 release cycle when Views was merged into Core. Um, and I'm going to just describe a little bit how, how do VDC worked. Uh, so we started out with an 8x, 3x branch of Views in the Views project repository and gradually worked on removing uh, Views external dependencies, mostly on C tools. Um, and stuff that we thought would be useful in the rest of core, um, like drop buttons, uh, the temporary storage, temp store, uh, config entities, ended up at, on, it, on their own as, as issues in the normal core queue. Um, so those issues uh, went through the normal core process and were adapted to core separately uh, before we went to merge views into core. Um, but once those re uh, dependencies were resolved, then Tim built us a sandbox um, that had views as a core module. And uh, Jeremy Thorson set us up so that TestBot could test that, which was invaluable, because core API changes were breaking our sandbox pretty much on a daily basis. And so it was really important to have that feedback to know whether or not it broke again. Um, and we knew going in that we had like seven years of technical debt to resolve. So once that we had the sandbox, I also spent some time crafting what I, I hoped was like a bulletproof issue summary. This goes back to what we were talking about in a previous core conversation. And I actually like wrote it in a Google Doc and reviewed it with the whole views and core team before I even posted it because I really wanted to make sure that the scope of the issue is clearly defined. Um, we had done a lot of cleanup and refactoring, but at the same time, you know, it's like the patch was the patch that we rolled to test views against core was 2.5 megabytes and views has like, you know, it's like a change that involved 500 files. Um, so uh, we ended up merging views in on October 22nd in 2012 and uh, that means that views has been in core now for exactly seven months. Seven months, guys. Yeah. Woo. Um, I should point out that we did make some exceptions to the normal core process when we merged views in. Um, there are still core gates issues open for views. Um, 
in, in our inner issue summary, we listed out the things that, um, that were not part of the issue, like coding standards, cleanups. We also identified some things that, if, if used had been a normal, just core patch, should have been part of it. And in particular, we knew that there were accessibility problems in views that we weren't going to be able to fix, in part because we were blocked um, on, on some issues in core. And in, as a matter of fact, we still have, um, we still have several accessibility issues, known issues that have been open for a long time because we're, we're blocked on this one particular issue. Um, so if you, have <laughs> if you have any interest in helping with the modal dialogues to make it so that Views is usable with a keyboard, that would be amazing and come to the code sprint on Friday and, and talk to Daniel. I, he didn't even look up, okay. Um, and there are also usability issues. We did a usability study on Views um, at Bad Camp. And I say we, like I planned it, all I did was sit there and, and go, oh my goodness. Um, but the, the, some of the usability contributors in the Drupal community set up a usability study and, and did that. Um, there were also performance concerns going in. We knew that our test coverage wasn't perfect. But at the same time, it was probably the right decision to make to merge Views in at that point in the release cycle because there was no way we were going to be able to finish all of those things by the December 1st code freeze. And it did a lot of good for the rest of core for views to be in that early because we were really able to, to have use cases to test some APIs that, that wouldn't have been available uh, without a module with, like views there. Uh, the second change I'd like to talk about is the um, Blocks' plugins conversion. <laughs> um, and this is the one that led to a big retrospective with all of the initiative owners and then in turn to this core conversation being proposed. So if it seems like I'm picking on this issue, that's the reason for it. And it was a pretty important learning experience for all of us. So in April of 2012, Chris Vanderwater, Eclipse GC, posted a 144K patch that added a new plugin API, a new block system, and a conditions module. And it also converted every single block in core to this new API. And it also converted the configured block instances to the then XML-based configuration management system. For those of you who are familiar with CMI, that's how long ago we're talking about here. Um, so once the plugin uh, system went in separately in August, August, you just, we just jumped from April to August, um, Chris posted an updated patch, and then he also added a UI overhaul into the mix to make the new user interface, a new user interface to support uh, a new model for placing blocks. Um, so while the patch converted all of the blocks, it didn't actually at that point update any of the test coverage. In fact, the issue was marked active until August, until Catch came and said it to needs review and was like, what's going on here? Um, and of course, you know, there were like hundreds of test failures because all these tests were using a block system that wasn't there anymore. Um, so a small group of dedicated superheroes, uh, Nasho uh, Camilla Anderson, I think is her last name, um, and several developers from ZivTech spent a bunch of time fixing those tests just to convert them to the new API. There were entire sprints dedicated to just getting the test, the old tests to pass for this one patch, whole sprints. Um, and by the time the patch was passing, it was 400K. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's when I came into the issue. And it took me 80 hours to read and review the entire patch. And I spe spent the better part of a transatlantic flight <laughs> writing up a comprehensive 3,000 word summary of my other reviews on this issue. Uh, I documented the remaining tasks, uh, filed follow-ups for it. I thought this issue was really important. You know, it, it, was, it was doing something that was laid in our architectural foundation for actually views in the future as well. Um, I tested it manually. I helped with some minor architectural issues. And then I invested another 30 hours of work or so in that part of it. Um, and meanwhile, merging head for this particular patch, because it was so big, was also failing on other core API changes daily. So Tim Plunkett and I spent a lot of time just fixing those merge conflicts over and over and over again. So on December 20th, and now we're from April to December 20th, we had this big call with Dries um, and several people from the, the Blocks and Layouts Initiative, and we came to the conclusion that the only way, the only way the Scotch Initiative was going to make any progress in this release cycle was to commit this patch now and just do the rest as follow-ups because it was there was so much overhead in re-rolling this patch and maintaining it. Um, so the idea was that after that happened, we would start crowdsourcing this follow-up issues because it was some things were no longer condensed in this one 300 comment 440k patch. Um, we would be able to get other people to make just one specific change, and it would be easier to find people to do that. Um, and so we committed the patch on January 4th with over 50 follow-ups already filed. I filed most of those myself, even though I'm not part of the Blocks and Layouts Initiative. Um, and we bent the rules pretty dramatically for that patch. Um, it did not provide an upgrade path for blocks at all. Um, 
it introduced a 15% performance regression in a, a, the one particular case that we profiled. Um, it had numerous UI usability issues, and the test coverage and documentation were also incomplete. Now, those still, issues still aren't resolved. <laughs> so what we have is fairly significant architectural debt in core right now. Um, we made a significant improvement, but at the same time, the trade-off has been a persistent risk to the release of Drupal 8. Um, now, I want to pause up for a second here and talk about the similarities and differences between views and core and uh, the blocks as plugins patch. Now, note that both, both patches added new APIs to core, um, and both had some exceptions granted to our normal policies in order to save them from this reroll hell that we were stuck in, where we couldn't make progress because we were spending so much time chasing head. Um, both had concerns about usability and accessibility and performance and test coverage, and both spawned a lot of follow-up issues um, and issues that still persist in all of these areas in some cases. Um, so that's important to note. You know, it's, it, it's not that views you know, was magic and wonderful and blocks did a horrible thing. There's definitely some similarities there. But there's also some key differences that have sort of affect how this has played out over the course of the release cycle. And the first thing is that the views API, which, you know, it's not perfect. It has been battle tested for seven years as a contributed module. Um, it's installed on 70% of Drupal sites, so there's definitely issues with it. But you, we, we have that community testing over time. Whereas Blocks was introducing an entirely new API, the plugin system based conceptually on C tools, but not the same thing. And also, and this is important, views went in three months before the first feature freeze. We're talking about the difference between October 22nd and January 4th, and that's, that's a, a big gap in terms of the release cycle, especially the last, the last year of the Drupal 8 release cycle. Um, also, views, unlike blocks and plugins, didn't actually signif significantly impact the rest of core when it went in. Um, in fact, if we had done the equivalent of what the Blocks' as plugins patch had tried to do in views, every core listing would have had to have been converted to a view before we merged views in, and we've done one of them so far by now in mid-May. We're working on three more that are, should land, I think, soon. I'm, you put your head down. Did it go in? No, okay, okay. Okay, you see, I thought you were putting your head down because the, I didn't touch the cue. Okay, so <laughs> they will go in. I, I have faith that there are at least one of these issues will go in this, this Friday. I'll put it that way. Um, but yeah, so if we had tried to, to convert every listing in core uh, to, <laughs> to views before you merge views, it just wouldn't have been possible. Um, and finally, the community made it a focus to start addressing views gates issues right away. Like I said, we had a usability, uh, usability study done at Badcamp, which was just like a week later. Um, and the accessibility issues, we, we tried to start working on them right away and then got blocked on this one thing that we couldn't really crowdsource. It's a problem that I don't know how to solve. Um, so it's, it's, there, there are similar situations, but there's also some important differences. Um, I'd like to move on to our third change. Um, this is the field API to CMI conversion. Um, Swentel filed this patch last August, um, and to start it was only 37K, um, and they got the patch passing tests pretty early in it, um, and people started reviewing it right away. Uh, the issue summary was clear, succinct, um, it was regularly updated with the changes in the status of the issue, issues related to it. Um, they worked on the conversion in a sandbox, uh, and they started adding an upgrade path in October. Um, now, the original issue had been posted before DrupalCon Munich, which is when we added the configuration entity API to core. Um, and, you know, after we added that API, it was pretty clear that fields should also use it for, for configured field instances. Um, so they had to convert to that as well. Um, and that, that Alex started working on that in November. Um, I can hear. Okay, so the, the thing that was most amazing about this issue is they, they always responded right away when someone posted something. Even when there was, uh, over the winter, there was sort of a period of silence when they were kind of blocked um, on an upgrade path problem. They still responded right away when someone posted the issue, what's going on here? Um, so that was cool. Um, so uh, Justin Bejebus did some uh, performance testing on this in the spring, and they also worked with him on that right away. Um, they posted sort of the, the canonical patch for it, the one that they said they thought was ready to be reviewed in, in March, right? Um, March 15th, I think, and um, and it was passing tests, and they actually updated the issue summary to indicate that they thought the issue was ready for serious reviews, which was awesome. Um, so uh, they, the, we 
myself and Alex Pott and Alex Bronseed um, did some detailed reviews, and they each time we posted a review, they followed up uh, responding to every point that we discussed. Um, and it, it actually, so the patch was 250K in the end, but it, it only, in quotes, took me about eight hours to review it, as opposed to the 80 I spent as the Blox's plugins patch, which was less than twice as large. So there's a significant difference there, and I'll, I'll get into in my lessons learned why I think that is. Um, so that they, you know, we had we had some miscommunication, misunderstandings originally, but they did. They were they were pretty supportive um, in terms of like filing follow up issues right away um, to make sure that things that I I brought up that were out of scope for the what they were trying to do ended up in follow up issues. Um, by the first week in April, they were still working through our feedback, you know, because it was a big patch. There was I and I read I read patches line by line. Um, so I had I posted quite a lot of information, um, and why should express that it was difficult to address all the feedback that we'd posted for such a insignificant change for such a large patch, and the words that he used were actually that it was daunting and somewhat soul crushing. Um, so after that, <laughs> so I felt really bad, and as soon as I could make time, I tried to help like filter out some of the noise in my reviews and other reviews. Um, I, Swentel gave me access to their sandbox and I made some just really stupid minor cleanups that I'd identified in my reviews. Uh, did the best I could do w with their documentation as far as I could understand it. Um, and then, then condensed my review down into one post that listed everything. Um, and that actually worked out pretty well because I had the privilege of RTB seeing it four days later. And then it was committed live um, at, what, Front End United is the name of it? Yeah. And there's a video. You can even watch, you can even watch them live when the patch is committed. It's pretty cool. And I have to say that like reviewing that patch after the experiences with blocks and plugins was rewarding because it reminded me that as, as a community of people working on Drupal Core, we should really trust each other. Um, and I wish that I'd remembered that going in. Um, and the fourth big change is one that's still underway, and that's the Twig conversion, uh, the converting uh, PHP templates to Twig templates. It's actually only a part of what the Twig initiative is trying, Twig unofficial initiative is trying to do. Um, and I should give a little background here. Um, there have been issues to convert templates to Twig, which is our new theme, hopefully our new, going to be our new theming system in Drupal 8, um, open since November. Uh, but um, they, for a while, they sort of trickled along, and then this spring, a bunch of people started working on them. Um, and you, if you work on core issues, you might have no noticed recently that a bunch of them were sitting at, at RTBC, which stands for Reviewed and Tested by the Community. I forgot to say that earlier. Um, it means that a core, it's the issue is ready for a core maintainer to look at it. It's gone through our QA process. Um, so, but since it's so late in the release cycle, it's already after our feature freeze and approaching our code freeze. Um, Dries has been working with the other core maintainers and with the leads of a couple initiatives to try to mitigate the risk that making changes at this point is going to push back our release date because that's something we definitely don't want. We saw the negative impact of that in Drupal 7 and um, it's, it's we, as much as possible we want to get Drupal 8 out the door sooner rather than later. So we need to, at this point in the release cycle, we're focused on managing our technical debt. Um, so what, what the Twig team agreed to do is that um, so that we don't have core half in one templating system and half in another templating system, which would be completely unusable for themers anywhere and make their lives much worse instead of better, um, we're going to convert all of the templates in one patch. And a lot of the individual templates are done already in individual issues, um, but what they're going to do is they're going to compile them into one patch. Um, it's sort of like, what they're doing is sort of the equivalent of pull requests on GitHub, but at the same time they're, they're using the issue queue patch, patchwork flow to do it, um, both because that's what they were most comfortable with and also because it gave them vis the visibility of the core queue to get this stuff reviewed. So that's still underway and it's making great progress, but it definitely followed a very different pattern from these other massive patches. So um, I, I have a bunch of lessons list here, and this is the point at which my presentation sort of collapses into just what I think. Um, <laughs> I was hoping to sort of consolidate this a little bit in, into more important messages, but I'm just going to go through them because I didn't really have time. I, I really overbooked myself this conference. It turns out that you can't like run, have like you know eight or ten technical discussions, try to run a sprint and present at three or four different things. That's just a really bad idea, and don't ever do it. And I'm not going to again. Um, and also, these lessons are, are things that I think were important. They, they come out of my experience as a reviewer, and more recently, my experience working directly with um, Dries and Webchick as, as core maintainers. Um, so lesson number one is that the risk of a big change 
And whether that risk is a concern depends on when we are in the release cycle. And this is something we really didn't think about with Blocks' plugins as much as we should have. So merging views in October was different from adding Blocks' plugins in January, and that was different from trying to get Twig in now in May, May or early June. Um, and that's something we'll need to keep in mind uh, as we go forward. As, and, well, in this release cycle, it's, it's already a focus, and, and uh, Dries is very concerned about it. Um, but it's also something we'll need to keep in mind, I think, through the whole initiative in Drupal 9, or sorry, the whole release cycle in Drupal 9. Uh, second lesson, lesson in three parts. And if, if you remember nothing else from my whole talk, I should remember this, which also means that I should have put it at the beginning or the end instead of in the middle. This is me not thinking ahead. But clearly define the scope of this issue. What I mean is say in your issue what, what's involved, what you're going to do, and what you're not going to do. Um, and don't mix apple and oranges. Only make one kind of change in an issue as much as is possible. Um, and also document that in the summary of the issue so that other people looking at it don't say, oh, hey, XJM. I would really like to help with the coding standard cleanups in your 2.5 megabyte views patch. No, we're not doing that now. Please come and see me later in May when we have the sprint on that, you know, in, uh, for example, DrupalCon Portland. Um, and so say what you're going to do, say what you're not going to do. Um, and um, part of that is, um, this is something we actually had a lot of success with in views. Um, if, if you, in the process of working on the main API for something, you find something else that you need from it first, um, if it, it, whether it's another new API or just refactoring some automated test to be more performant and more decoupled, um, just immediately split that off and do it in a separate issue in the core queue because you'll be able to get that in. That will make your patch smaller and reduce the burden on this, this one particular point of failure um, for what the change you're trying to make. Plus, it also benefits the rest of core at the same time and ensures that one piece of it isn't going to break the next time someone else makes an update to that file. Um, and part 2C is file follow-up issues pro proactively. So someone comes to you and says, um, okay, uh, I, I tested this with taxonomy, and um, the, I, when I, deploy, when I de deploy a configuration change with a taxonomy field, it breaks because it's referencing the, the taxonomy term ID instead of the UUID, and you know, that's broken. Um, you know, point out that there's already another issue addressing that problem. It's, it's because of the fact that taxonomy terms um, the, the enti entity reference fields and taxonomy reference fields are not yet using unique identifiers. That, I probably shouldn't have gone through that whole example, but that's an, like any kind of thing that um, is totally out of the scope of your initiative and you're afraid will derail the discussion in your initiative, you can just immediately fire back with another issue. And when, when we merged views in, we did this very aggressively um, because it's a relevant discussion, not part of our discussion here, and that will make sure that any comments about that shunt off to that issue. You don't have to deal with it until later. Um, and again, the, the difference between what's a blocker and what's a follow-up is, is important. I, I have two parts there. They're similar, but they're different because one set of things you need to do beforehand and one set of things you're going to do after. And the set of things you do after can't include regressions. If you, there, your patch introduces a regression, you always need to fix it in that patch. It shouldn't include things that are the core gates, usability, um, accessibility, testing, documentation, and performance, um, unless you're, you're actually like, you've communicated with a core maintainer and gotten approval that the, that, that, that regression or that gap is acceptable for, in, for a short term. Um, <laughs> part three. Please update your issue summaries. Please keep them up to date. Start with one that's useful so people look at it and keep adding information to it to communicate to other people who want to work on it what the status of the issue is. Um, it's amazing. I, so I, I mentioned that I have the opportunity to uh, look, see somewhat how, how Dries and WebJick review patches and it's it, the number of times that Dries stops and says, okay, so, can, so, so what is the goal of making this change? And it's like step back, why are we really doing this? And that's a very important question to ask. So I think that part of our job um, as, as developers is to communicate what, what our, actually our goals are, that we're not just refactoring for the sake of refactoring. There's an end, there's an end goal that we're working toward. Um, add your test coverage in docs thoroughly. I use, I use automated tests as a way to explain to me what a piece of code is expected to do. Um, and so when, when a patch does not provide new unit-ish test coverage for its new APIs, that's very, it makes it more difficult for me to review. That's one of the challenges I encountered with the Blocks' plugins patch. The other challenge was that it, it wasn't very thoroughly documented. And documentation, by the way, doesn't mean just adding a stub one-liner that follows um, our rather anal documentation standards for a function or a class or whatever. It also means actually explaining what your code does. 
Um, so that means like paragraphs of text that people can read that explain how your architecture fits together and what the big picture is. Provide inner diffs. Um, that's all I have to say about that. Um, so this is a trick we used. Um, if you're trying to get tests to pass, uh, do that first in a, a helper issue to just reduce the noise in the main issue. It means that there's less, there's fewer times that people have to look and find out that, oh, your test failed again. And it makes it easier for people to scan down and what's seeing, what, see what's going on. Smaller patches are more successful. Um, <laughs> if you're making a big change, that's kind of a problem. But think about how you can make your patch smaller. Um, and in terms of reviewing the patch, in terms of re-rolling it, in terms of someone understanding it, uh, I, I think I do okay with about 50 to 60K of patches in one sitting. Obviously, it depends on the kind of change, but I mean 50 to 60K of actual code changes. When it gets to be about 100K, I start to burn out, and when it's over that, I, I personally like have to break it up. I can't even go through it in one sitting. Um, that said, your meta conversion issues to do the follow-ups will take a lot longer than you expect. Um, we've seen this in views, we've seen this in the configuration management system. If you're planning to in introduce an API first and then change things to it later, just keep in mind that you th if you think you're going to be done by 2012, you'll be done in 2013. Also another thing that can be troublesome about this is that sometimes it's hard to understand the big picture from just one individual patch. Um, so. Uh, that's something that to keep in mind. I think that that can be best addressed through by having having a roadmap and documenting clearly what your overall goal is, like I mentioned earlier. Start with the test implementation. So just convert one thing that shows your thing works in an automated test, and that will explain your API, and it will also keep you from you know you verifies that it works without you having to convert everything, um, and use a backwards compatibility layer. Um, this is something that we've argued a lot about in this release cycle, whether or not we should temporarily add a, a backwards compatibility layer so that we can use code that's using the old API while we're introducing the new API. And overall, I think that we've come down on the side of yes for um, the, during the development phase especially. It's, it's a necessary part of getting change done. <laughs> um, the closer that we get to release, it becomes more problematic and obviously there's, if, if we're not going to be able to remove that backwards compatibility layer, that's a problem, but overall it's been successful. Lesson number eight is help, help people who are reviewing your patches. Um, there's just not enough people in core who are reviewing changes. It's, it's time consuming, it's a challenging skill to learn. Um, reviewers are looking at a lot of different issues in the day. So, so you know, be nice to them, help them. If, if help them find where in your issue it says a certain thing that you know that they don't. Um, help them file follow-up issues. And also indicate in your issue what you want reviewed. Um, you know, it, it could be that you're at a point where you want architectural review or you're just looking to have review of one piece. Tell us that. We, we, if we know that, then we can focus our attention and not waste time on things that aren't ready yet. Um, and, and also, please keep in mind that, that people who are volunteer contributors who are reviewing your code aren't trying to, you know, beat gatekeepers and block your work. They're also trying to help your patch get in. So. Converse side of that is help people whose code you are reviewing. <laughs> Um, and this is something, you know, this is, this is the lesson that I forgot when I was looking at the field CMI, the CMI patch. You need to stop doing that. Um, you know, make, make your reviews organized. Summarize your own points. Don't just sit there and go, you need a white space error here and this comment's formatted wrong and just a big string of things and then not give any substantive feedback because that's a waste of everyone's time. Make those changes yourself or find a new contributor who will actually get benefit out of making those fixes in that patch. Um, we want people to be validated by our Q&A process and not feel like um, we're, we're attacking them, basically. Um, be an issue manager. When you're making a change, don't just think about the patch. Think about controlling the entire discussion and the issue. Um, and this sort of includes everything I've already, I've already discussed. Um, it's your job to be like a PR person for your change, to communicate with people about it, um, and to keep, to keep all the information and the issue together. Because like an issue, if, if all we needed was the patch, we wouldn't have issues. We would just have patches. We need to actually communicate about the changes that we're making, otherwise, what's the point? Um, and number 11, this is something Shannon talked about, is build a team. This doesn't have to be something on the scale of the, the, you know, the views team. Um, it, it's just really helpful to have at least one other person who's also working on the issue with you because they can give you meaningful feedback. Um, they know what you're going through. You can trade reviews with them, uh, do back and forth work on it. And 
Also, if you end up getting burned out on the issue, there's someone to take it over for you for a period of time. Um, we, this, for example, the, the admin people issue, where we're converting the uh, admin people listing to a view, and it's gotten stuck a number of times on both weird bugs and uh, maintainer feedback. And so we, we've, I think we've gone through <laughs> We've gone through the entire team at this point, um, but it's it, <laughs> it, it, it can help a lot. Just that when you're when you're tired of working on something, have someone else to step up and take over. So make your issue readable, make it reviewable, make it understandable, and help each other out, and also cut down on the noise that's in the issue. Those are my thoughts. Um, and so yeah, let's talk about it. I have I have this slide that says I would prefer not to talk about sandboxes and GitHub's and issue queue improvements and all that. I'm more interested in your thoughts on like actually you know, making changes and whether you think that things that I've said are a big fat lie. Um, but we can also talk about that if people get bored. Go back to the summary slide so we're not looking at those words. There. If you file, up good, if you file good follow-up issues and organize lots of meta issues, you might recruit the next core maintainer. Yes. Wait, I don't understand. By giving <laughs> things uh, by, by creating um, follow-up issues, meta issues, like all the CMI issues that Greg created and got me involved in, he recruited the next core maintainer. So, and you also teach people to use your system. So if you yep. do everything at once, then no one knows apart from you. Yes. Like we've got to share and, the and information. And the poor SOP who reviewed the patch. Yeah, so I, I wanted to expand on that and another point from you. I wanted to expand on that and another point from you earlier. Um, as the risk management and, and how to do your stuff. So, so my tip there is do stuff early, very mm -hmm. early. Okay. So if you do stuff early, there's a, a mountain of advantages. You use the API from the previous version of Drupal because there's not much changed. So it's easy to do the change that you want to do. Yeah. We converted views in, what was it, three hours, Tim? Right. Right, <laughs> two hours. So if you do stuff early, you don't need to convert like to all the new systems that were introduced. If you do stuff early, then the responsibility of converting them to the system will not necessarily be on you because that will be in the system, so others will need to work with it. If you do stuff early, you will be able to to um, to advertise your change, and others will be able to work with it. Mm -hmm. So whatever you did will be an integral part of the system, and not feel like a parallel thing that you did because you weren't working with the other things that were already there. Um, you will you will be able to get feedback and refine your work. So like Greg rearchitected CMI three times because he did the the initial iteration first instead of like just working on the issue himself and 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 not like getting it into core and not like getting that visibility so there's just a mountain of advantages there doing it early i think uh, we've had some of some of our issues like this where people said no no you shouldn't do this because there's this re-architecting going on and maybe later it will be this new subsystem that will that will make it totally different they were like no we are doing this right now and and it paid off very well we have yes, all those features in <laughs> Um, and the other thing is is uh, is the communication thing. Um, so I think I think documenting what you do very well is very important. Uh, first, it makes people aware of what you do. And sometimes we end up with parallel systems that are very similar, but they are different because people have been working on them parallelly and they were not aware of the other solutions. And if we document what we do and why we do it, uh, then we can get people learn uh, learn them. So what I did, for example, with the configuration schema system is actually implementing configuration schemas is not that hard. Uh, so there are complex examples, but the basics are easy. <laughs> it's like so when it was committed, I wrote like a huge documentation page with examples, and then I've opened a whole lot of issues, and then I expected people, like, and then I was trying to recruit people to work on them and expected I can crowdsource it, and not just crowdsource it so it's ready sooner, but crowdsource it so people validate my documentation and they validate the schema system in itself and, and put feedback into improving it. So if I do it early, I have time to have those breakout issues. I have time to have, based on documentation, get people improve my system um, because they work on it and, and can contribute back. What happened there is unfortunately, unfortunately, and also fortunately, I have a person who solved all of the issues. 
Um, so <laughs> yes, that, that was, does happen. <laughs> so that was good because now we have all, all of the schemas there. It was not good because knowledge was not spread. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think if you have that documentation pinned down, that helps a lot there. I would agree. Okay. So something I'm actually wondering about is um, how many people in this room are, are familiar with what the Drupal 8 release schedule looks like? Like have an idea of when Drupal 8 is being released or, wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, or, or have an idea when code freezes. That's probably a safer question to ask. Okay. Um, so uh, how many people are familiar with the, what the core gates are? Drupal core gates? Wow, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, okay. So you want, I'm not going to actually, a very small number of people raised their hands in answer to the second question. Um, so that's something I mentioned in my discussion about views. We have our, our review process for Drupal core is very rigorous and we don't, we don't ever want to regress our functionality um, in these five key areas that I keep, men I mentioned several times in my talk, but we don't want to make Drupal slower. We managed to make Drupal a lot slower during Drupal 8, like significantly. Um, so we need to work on that one. Um, we, we always make sure that we add test coverage for changes that we make so that if there's a bug, we don't break it a second time. Um, for the third gate's accessibility, we don't ever want to regress our accessibility coverage. Um, and, and views did because there's, there's all of a sudden there's this very useful, important module in core that's not, not usable at all with a keyboard because, because we can't, you know, we haven't converted views from its previous broken models to use the new accessible modal dialogue that we got and that was finished, I think, in February. Um, uh, then usability is the fourth one, and I lost track of, did I say all five? Um, so usability is, is the, so usability, oh, and documentation. Um, all the code that goes into Drupal core needs to be documented to explain what it does. So that's what those are. Um, and so we have this, we have this policy that, um, ever heard of issue thresholds? No? <laughs> I think people are just ignoring me and not raising their hands right now. <laughs> I just wanted to get an idea. I was expecting a very different audience here, and I was kind of nervous about this conversation, all, core conversation all day, because I didn't have time to prepare for it. So I apologize for those of you who are dozing in the back. Hey, Klausi. So one thing that we do with big changes, we always have the requirement that all test cases pass. <clears throat> what do you think about a short period of time where you introduce a big change and tests may fail for a week, for example? I think that's extremely disruptive. Um, I mean, like, it, it basically forces all of our other core development to work around it, and I, that's, my, that's my gut reaction. I mean, but at the same time, like, that, you know, if we, if we can get automated testing in sandboxes, I think that's good. I don't think that it's ever, I mean, have we ever been in a situation where so tell me why more, why more about why you think that that might be a feasible idea and, and what, you think, what problem you think that could solve. Because the reviewers could uh, focus more on the actual implementation without um, seeing all these pieces in the patch that just fix something okay. or change the syntax there and there so the patch gets huge and you could have a much smaller patch and then um, when there is consensus on that, just put it in and then try to get really uh, community involvement to fix all the other moving pieces and to get to a, a passing test state again. I, I think that... I guess it's mm, dangerous. Yeah, yeah I, I think, and it's also, there's, it's also very hard to f get someone to fix something that's already in, uh, like we found with the blocks patch. Like, there's so many bugs with it still. Get in line. You can, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know, something that might work like that is, is if, you had multiple patches in the issue. So you had one that was, these are the big things, and then you had the other one like, this is everything that's not quite as critical. Mm -hmm. So it's, it w they, would, they would be committed together. Like the, the issue wouldn't pass unless they were both together, but you could review them separately. So we, they, people have done, tried to do that a couple times, but I actually don't find it that useful. Personally, like, and maybe this is a personal thing. Um, for me, what explains how something works is its test coverage. And if it's just an, like an incidental test failure because it's using an old API, that's where the BC layer comes in handy. And we should fix that anyways to explain how our code works. Um, and it, it's not so much that it's, I, I, I'm perfectly capable of, of like ch chopping the file up myself into different pieces to review. 
Um, I think that what's what's important is is not just the file size; it's what's included in it. But then you have to do that yourself. But I'm saying that it doesn't actually like. I, I'm saying that the reason that it doesn't make a difference for, to me personally, and, and this could like. This could be, anyone else might have a, a different opinion about this, but for me, automated tests are part of what Explain the Code does to me, so. That's my thought. So for committing stuff that's not passing, I think it's very dangerous because then you will not be able to commit anything else yeah. until tests pass again. Because you never know, even if, our, if it's the same tests failing, same set of tests failing as before, you never know if they are failing for different reasons or they are even more stuff broken, so I don't decide that would block core development on anything else until tests are fixed. I mean, core like if, if test bot fails randomly because there was an environment problem on a test bot, um, when core is tested, like core development just stops and everything that everyone's working on that day gets requeued and you have to wait for hours for stuff to happen and, and we harass Alex and beg him to fix the change that was made that's now causing failures, that kind of thing happens. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm not convinced that there's any case in which that getting rid of the testing gate to the point that tests are actually failing would ever be a good idea, personally. But. Yeah, so, so I think that so you could use sandboxes or other, or, right. or yeah. other environments where you can get people to review your stuff without it passing, that's fine. And I think that you, know, you can even do something where you, you add a BC layer temporarily um, in your sandbox that you're going, you intend to get rid of even in the same patch just so that you don't have the noise of, of that test failures if you want people to review your architecture early. But like I mentioned, for me, having the documentation and testing the patch, those aren't an afterthought. That's part of that if, if you want your code to do something, there should be a test that explains how you do that. So, you know, so any questions, comments? Um, so something I just wanted to point out is that um, in case you didn't know, so right now Drupal core is, Drupal 8 core is in feature freeze. The code freeze is in five weeks. So that what that means is that we can't add major new features anymore to Drupal 8. We're done with that. We have most of the feature set that we're probably going to have it released. Um, but we can still make API changes for contributed modules. However, something you might not have known is that it's actually possible still to add minor features to Drupal core. Um, if they, if at this point, um, they can still break APIs even, just so long as they're not significant things that would introduce more architectural debt. Um, but in order to do that, we have to actually fix other issues first. We have to fix the major and critical issues until we get them down to an acceptable level. Um, so when I'm talking about all these big changes and so forth, in some ways this isn't, I mean, at this point in the release cycle, it's, it's mostly just cleanup work we're doing, but we're probably gonna see more of these 200 and 300K patches as the work in some, like, um, I'm sure that some of the work that's going on in, in to convert fields to the new API is gonna be involve significant changes and so forth. You guys are really quiet. No thoughts? I'm looking at you, dear. No? Okay. <laughs> I just like spammed a bunch of information at you and I thought you'd you know, argue more. I don't bite, so if you've got a really big patch, reach out to me when it gets to RTBC because it really helps if you talk to me. Yeah, actually ha being available online, this is something I skipped over because I decided I was blathering too much, but um, being available online to talk about your patch is really valuable, um, both for reviewees and reviewers. Um, unfortunately, that's not always possible. Oh, ha! <laughs> um, so, um, how many people in here use IRC? Okay, that's better. Online in IRC, in the Drupal-contribute channel, hash Drupal-contribute channel on Freenode. That's where um, core, both core and contrib development kind of happens in Drupal. It's sort of a hub of our communication. And we use that as a workaround for the fact that it's, it's hard to communicate through core issues or any issues. Um, I guess I just wanted to confirm that one of your lessons was like help out the guys that are working on a patch yeah. actually works. I mean, the, the part where Watchit was like going crazy was the fact that you posted a review, then we started commenting, and then suddenly there was another review, and then you, it was impossible to follow it at that point. And when you were in the sandbox making those little changes, it was really, really helpful. So thank you for that. I mean. Um, it, it, well, it took a long time, and I don't, I'm, so I, I was trying to think about what strategies would make that easier, because um, obviously there aren't that many people who are even going to run into this problem, because there aren't that many people who are willing to review a 200K patch. Um, but I, you know, it's like, so if I don't document for myself on the issue, the things that I noticed, I will forget by the end of the patch. So it's like, do I have to, like, in, in order to have a, a nicely formatted Dreader review, do I have to then paste that in, in a 
handbook page on Drupal.org to save it until I have the opportunity to write that 3,000 word, never again actually, summary of everything? Like would that have been, I mean is, is, like, is it just having the comments there or was it not clear that I wasn't actually just done reading the whole patch yet? Yeah, I, I think that was it. I mean, there were too many comments. I mean, we know that the issue queue is not that flexible and stuff mm -hmm. like that. We know that, but I mean, there were too many comments and there were valid comments, um, but there was just too many. And what's actually also sometimes annoying is that you get an email and I, I, I remember at some point reading my emails was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to the issue queue and you added the comment and was like, okay, this is okay again. So. <laughs> Watch out for that. <laughs> it's people who subscribe to issues by email, I don't understand. I, I can't, I wouldn't, I don't even, I can't imagine how you could possibly manage that much email. But obviously people do it, so. Yeah, filter. <laughs> Filtering based on what? I mean, I don't know. I don't get it. That's okay. Do you have any idea about how we manage these huge issues that have 200 comments, 300 comments? Do you think it's a good idea to just, uh, to just force close them? I think we, we did that a couple of times. We did that with where, CMI. Yeah, where just a uh, Drupal.org administrator steps in and just closes the issue. Is that a good idea? <laughs> well, so I, it, I'm, I mean, we also did things where we like actually deleted all the noisy comments in the issue, like deleted system message failing tests and people changing issue statuses and we managed to keep the Bloxus plugins patch issue at one page for that reason. But it was still 300 comments. Um, and issue summaries are also another workaround for that noise factor. So the, the, so the problem then is that you have to, to move to the other issue, you just need someone to summarize the entire status of that previous issue. But it is a lot, it's a lot less intimidating to go to like this one issue that has all this work done previously and say, oh, I can, I can help with this, I understand what this is, I don't have to read 300 comments to figure out what's going on. It does require someone, though, to invest the effort of actually communicating what was done previously and posting whatever final patch was. And I am hopeful, you know, maybe if you want, we can talk about the issue queue improvements. I am hopeful that in the future, the Drupal.org issue queue will do a better job of exposing what's important on an issue as opposed to the noise. Um, but it's, it's definitely a constant challenge for yeah. everyone. Because currently, if an issue has 200 comments, you can consider it dead. It's that most, most of the time, there is no way to get uh, an actual committed patch out of it. You just have to close it, let's start again in a new issue. Basically, pointing mm -hmm. to the other one, there is the whole discussion you can read there, but we have now some better understanding, let's start again. Yeah. It's definitely something we've done, and I don't know if we should do it earlier. Um, I don't know if that's feasible. And, and so like one, at least one of the issues that I listed was in that situation. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it would have actually been beneficial. All right, if no one else has any comments, questions, I'm gonna, we have 10 minutes left, but okay. I'm gonna, okay. Um, so doing big, doing, even not as big as those, right? But doing a review where you have many comments mm -hmm. so that you don't crush the people who worked on it, um, but you might need to do it in parts. Uh, is, it all, is it at all helpful to say, I made it one third of the way through, I'm not going I to always come said back that. I said that in every single post. I always said, I have read this part of the patch. And so obviously it didn't, it didn't help them. But I, it didn't help. It didn't help. Because th they still have to take the time to look and see what I said, even if they just read that part. And it's, but easy, it's also easy to scan to the gray code snippet box that you're commenting on and miss that one little line. So um, do you prefer to get it all at once? Or you just would prefer to not get feedback? <laughs> Wait, here. <laughs> but if you have no comments at all, there's performance problems and architectural problems and other problems that persist. I don't think I have an answer to that mm -hmm. because I haven't been in an issue where all comments from the review have been in one comment. So I, I don't know. I'm not sure whether it would have been uh, a big help if, if everything was in one comment mm -hmm. because then maybe we'll be, we would be uh, soul crushed because it would have been extremely long. <laughs> because it's 10 pages long, yeah, right? Yeah, I have to scroll for like hours to review it. I don't know. And, and what I did for the Bloxus plugins issue is actually, I told Chris online that I'm not done reviewing this. So I posted these God, like 10 comments over the course of two weeks. 
Um, and in each case, they were in a numbered list, and I grouped them by like whether they were a coding standards issue at the bottom of the post or whether they were like a severe architectural question. This is really broken looking at the top of the post. And then after that, it, like it said, it took me a flight from London to Minneapolis <laughs> to summarize what I had gone through in that patch. So it's a, another pardon. Go. OK, so don't want to be blasphemic or whatever. Don't want to blaspheme, but comments are not the place for code reviews. You put the, the the code is the place where the code review should occur. So if you look at what a lot of other people use, like we could talk about GitHub, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of other solutions like FishEye or Crucible, or whatever you want, or Garrett. The, the the review should be in the code, and then then it doesn't matter if there's one comment. So like or adding a to do. Yeah. I, I actually I did do that in the in the field patch for things that I couldn't fix myself. Um, I. The problem is that I also then the blocks patch and a lot of those two to do's are still there. Um, but yeah, actually, I think that actually is helpful because then then the person who's reading the issue doesn't have to go back and like find like go to that file, go to that line, and say first of all, does she even know what the heck she's talking about? Secondly, um, okay, now I know what this changes to make, and now I have to look and go back and look in context. So in that case, they can just apply the updated commented on patch. Yay, they're not dead back there. <laughs> oh, okay. At the other, on the other hand, though, that makes it harder for other people to see what you've already said. So if someone had done that to one of my issues, I would have been pissed at the amount of time everyone would have wasted. Because if, if you're just going through and changing my path, like, unless you have, are working in my sandbox, which I always have a sandbox, like, I'm going to make other changes. And your inner diff is now useless to me. And it would just waste my time mm -hmm. to have to do, use that and not just have in the issue. I mean, I don't think comments are necessarily the place for it, but if we had like GitHub style comments, I know I'm not supposed to talk about GitHub. You can now. I'm, I'm, I'm done not, with talking about GitHub because like, it seems a, to be the answer. To visually separate um, discussion and, and, and real review with mm -hmm. like, this is wrong. There's, you know, if, if I miss a, a leading slash, it's not up for discussion. I did it wrong. <laughs> like that's different. Uh -huh. um, but no, I mean, I, I would, please don't do that to my issues. Don't <laughs> fix don't add to dos and then post a you know 180k patch with to dos in it. <laughs> I agree. That's not what I was trying to suggest. I was trying to suggest that if you seriously go and look at GitHub, go and look at uh, Fisheye, go and look at Garrett. There are amazing code review solutions out there. This problem has been solved. Hey, Greg. Hi. We have six minutes left. Anyone else have anything else? Um, <laughs> mostly me, me just running through a bunch of stuff that I didn't really finish or finish preparing for because I have too much other stuff to do. But yeah, there's a lot of information. So apparently, I was expecting more people like, oh, so um, for anyone who's not familiar, the people who keep asking questions here, um, this is Gabor Hoshi, he's the lead for the Multilingual Initiative. The guy that just walked in is Greg Dunlap, um, he's the lead for the Configuration Management Initiative. Alex Pott here is a core maintainer, um, Kathy down here is my favorite person in the world. Um, I have lots of favorite people, but um, Kathy is a, you know, a top contributor to the to the multilingual initiative and also um, a very active core mentor. Um, and let's see who else has questions. Christoph is that's Swentel. He worked. On, he is a co-maintainer now for the field API. Um, so these are all, and, and, and Tim is uh, one of the people on the views and core team and also the top contributor to AAA right now. So these are all, what? St. Tim, I'm supposed to say St. Tim now, right? That's what he's <laughs> shaking his head. So it, it, it's obviously a very in-group discussion about like these changes that we confront every day as people who are really active. And I, you know, I it, just talking about it, I realized that we, you know, something that, you know, in the other half of my life that's not about this, which is about trying to help people on the outside understand what we on the, this, this inside that talk about this in this secret language do, is trying to break down some of those walls. Um, and I feel like, you know, our, our issue queue has kind of become a wall um, because we're talking about all these strategies for how to work around things that it doesn't do well um, to help ourselves when we spend all day using this tool. Um, and how could anyone who doesn't do that every day possibly understand it? As I, I'm going to do more question asking. So um, ha has anyone in here ever attempted to review a Drupal core patch at all? 
Okay, okay, that's a lot. That's better. Okay, good. <laughs> I was starting to get kind of worried. Um, so that's good. Like, does anyone want to give me examples of, of issues that you've looked at and worked on? You can shout it out. Don't worry. Don't bother with the mic because, you know. Anyone? You, a lot of you raised your hand. What's an example of, of an issue you worked on? Like, not these guys. I know what they did. Aw. You guys, you're terrible. You need feedback. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I've tried to take a look at a lot of kind of low hanging fruit documentation type taxes or example config type taxes, mm -hmm. you know, things that are very, very approachable and, and you know, do users to groups where they take a look at those and you know, try to make it easy, easy to use for those, those types of people. Um, most often than not, you know, they're, they're pretty easy to go in and, and, and make the change and get your view on it fairly quickly. Sometimes there's a lot of politics arguing about is this the, the right way to No. <laughs> So uh, yeah, what, what Jared was saying, just to briefly summarize, is, is that you know reviewing documentation, patches, um, example changes, uh, and that even that <laughs> can involve political discussion, even for those fairly self-contained, well-defined issues. Hey, uh, actually, um, thank you. Um, I'm Dylan, probably better known as Grenzi. Um, I, just as a, something that I've worked on this winter was the. Um, the file, some file metadata things in the file API. Um, and that's been one of the, I don't know the answer, but it's been a hard part for, for me as a contributor with, with uh, less time probably than most of you, um, just keeping up with like a big change. So we were working on, like we did <laughs> yeah. a really terrible thing in Drupal 7 where we put the file metadata in the file reference thing. So if you change that and you've got 10, you know, 10 different entities referencing the same file, you've got to change it in 10 different places, which um, so anyway, we were working on that, and I, you know, we kind of had, had a few weeks into it, and had all you know whiteboarded it, and almost put together what we thought was going to work, and then all of a sudden it was like, you know what, we don't actually need that because there's going to be this new file, some other file meta or some other metadata API. Um, <laughs> so like I said, I don't know what the like answer is. Thing. It's just that like if you're you know, um, maybe it's even just knowing that you know when someone's going in, knowing like what's the scope of of what can you take on personally and knowing like when you're ready to even get involved with with one of those huge you know mega patches or something like that um, and, and running into the situation where um so this the metadata api has that landed like is it did it actually get in because that's something that gabor mentioned you know it's, yeah, it's like yeah. you end up waiting for something that's new and shiny to solve your problem i i don't know actually if it did land but um that, that's yeah uh my name is john antoine uh, known as J. Antoine on Drupal.org, formerly known as Antoine Solutions. Um, I, ha I haven't reviewed a core patch, mm -hmm. uh, but I tried to write a form element with Drupal 7 and ended up running into checks in code looking specifically for if this is a checkbox, do this, or if this is a mm -hmm. uh, radio, do this. And I was trying to work with checkbox and uh, radios. so. It wasn't working, so I didn't handle it correctly, but uh, it brought me back to the first uh, session I attended, which I've been pretty much in this room, uh, but it was Mark um, on unit testing. And um, just hearing all of the core discussions, unit tests and having OOP code, I think would tremendously help the complexity that a lot of fresh Drupalers uh, deal with. Like the, I, hope so. I hope so. Um, so I, I would say that right now in Drupal 8, we have added a lot of OO in Drupal 8. I would say right now we've actually increased the complexity because we're in a situation where we have a mix of both, where there's procedural, either actual procedural code in classes and sometimes, or at least procedural philosophically code in it. And, and the community is still really learning how to do that because Drupal, you know, as a project, comes from a time when PHP didn't really have good object support. I mean, like, you couldn't really do object-oriented code in, in PHP 4 and earlier in an effective way. Um, so we're, we're just now, uh, I think Larry Garfield likes to say we're porting, we're porting Drupal from being a PHP 4 application to being a PHP 5.3 application. And, and we're still, I think, as, as a community learning what exactly that's going to mean for us. So I, but I hope, you, I hope you'll see more of that in Drupal 8, and, and I hope that it's, it's not more confusing. <laughs> Anyone else? 
Hey, Eve. I, I'm done. That's it. <laughs> We're out of time, which is good. Let's all go have dinner. See? So why should here? Got, built me a statue, and she's a little bit smaller than might have been advertised, and she has a whip here. Um, so if, if you get one of my reviews, just, just remember. Be nice to me. I worked really hard, and I care about you, and I care about your code, and I want to help you get in, and I'm very sorry if I make your life worse. That's all. I'm done.